Welcome everyone to the June joint session of the VLC, establishing and conducting surveillance and case management for perinatal HCV among pregnant persons. Uh, my name is Isabella Chuga, I use she a pronouns, and I am part of the hepatitis team at NASDAD. So joining us today is the moderator for today's session, Michael Abassian, research data analyst three, epidemiologist slash evaluator, with the Sexually Transmitted Diseases Control Branch of the California Department of Public Health, who is joined by the presenters of this session, Danica Kuncio, who's a member of NASDAD's HEPTAC Advisory Committee and the Viral Hepatitis Program Manager at the Philadelphia Department of Health, and Amelia Salmonson, also a member of NASDAD's HEPTAC Advisory Committee and the Viral Hepatitis Coordinator with the Utah Department of Human Services. So as usual, um, participants will be placed on mute for optimal audio, but please use the chat box to introduce yourself and jurisdiction and to ask questions. And so the format today, I'm gonna to turn it over to Michael to get us um, warmed up with a poll. And so Michael, I will wait for your prompts. Great, thank you, Isabel. Hi, everyone, thank you for joining. Uh, we're going to start off with some questions to help us all get a better sense of who is in the room and where we're at in the process with our, our own perinatal hepatitis C programs. So our first question, which I think you should be seeing now, is which type of organization best describes your institution? And the options are local health department, state health department, major city county health department, federal partner, a nonprofit or other. Um, go ahead and Fill that out if you can. See some results coming in. Did it launch all three questions? Oh, it looks like it did, yes. Okay. Uh, so the second question is, how far along is your organization in perinatal hepatitis C work? Here's the options there. Perinatal, we're working through backlog from these past few COVID years. Thinking about it, but we have more urgent work and concerns. Thinking about it, we might tackle it next. Putting our thoughts into action and advocating roadblocks. We're basically perinatal probes. Um, and then the third question, how much staff do you have dedicated to perinatal perinatal hepatitis C work. Um, and those, 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 there are some FTE options there for full-time employment. We have a response rate of We could maybe give it another minute or so just to have the final responses come in. Mm -hmm. 64% have participated. Welcome everyone. All right, it's stable at 68%. Okay, great. Let's, um, can folks see the responses or? I think I have to end it first. Let's end it. Share results. Okay. So for the type of organization, we have majority of our state health departments at 75% and a little spread between local health departments, major city county health department and federal partner. Let's get to see that. Um, how far along is your organization perinatal hepatitis C work? Majority at 44% are putting our dots into action and navigating the roadblocks uh, with the second highest being a tie between thinking about it, but we have more urgent work thinking about it and we might tackle it next at 13% each. 
and then uh, six percent for not funded. Perinatal question mark exclamation marks twelve percent. Uh, working through backlog from COVID, and then for twelve percent are basically perinatal pros. So we might have some expertise here. Um, and then how much staff do you have dedicated to perinatal hepatitis C work? Majority are indicating uh, none at 29%, 0 0.1 to 0 0.4 FTE at 25. And then um, the rest of the options are there at one FTE, two or more FTE and um, less than half. There we go. Okay, so now that we have a better sense of who's in the room, uh, we could turn it over to our first presentation, which is going to be by Danica. Um, Danica, if you want to share your slides, we could get started. Yes, thank you. Bear with me, everyone. Can you see my screen? Yes. Oh, great. Awesome. Um, okay, hi everyone. Um, uh, thanks for joining this afternoon. Um, I am really excited to have this conversation today. I hope it's a conversation um, and uh, really excited to partner with Amelia um, on, on speaking about um, perinatal hepatitis C and, and um, uh, activities health departments can be can be considering or working on in our experiences. Um, uh, I'm, I gotta say, I'm really excited by those poll results. Um, it sounds like a lot of people are uh, moving in the direction of, or have already um, started um, varying levels of work around a Perry C. And so um, uh, for those of you who haven't heard me talk about perinatal hepatitis C, I um, am really excited and passionate about this work and hopefully won't be duplicating too much of what I've said in the past, but um, really, um, I'm just excited to, to share and chat with everyone. So thank you for listening. I'll move on. Um, so some work we've done um, that really um, instigated our um, work in Philadelphia around perinatal hepatitis C was, was looking at um, uh, births um, to uh, people uh, who are hepatitis C positive according to our surveillance registry. And then we identified um, a meaningful number of, of people, it was about 3%, and um, looked to see if we had any information on testing for the infants born to pregnant or to hepatitis C positive people, and um, found really low rates of screening amongst infants. And so for the takeaways from this for us were there was meaningful um, exposure happening in Philadelphia, um, and that was, um, without a universal screening guideline amongst pregnant people, and that testing amongst infants was um, likely to not be comprehensive. So we had to make some programming decisions. What were we going to do with this, right? Um, this, there was no real national conversation at the time, and um, we certainly weren't funded, like with the perinatal hepatitis B program, and at the time we, we received some CDC funds for surveillance. So, we wanted to think about what we could do, what did we have capacity for, and what was a meaningful intervention as well. We didn't want to just be doing something to do something um, to check it off the box, and none of us have time for that, quite frankly. So we did a little bit of a pilot assessment. So we looked um, at um, uh, parents who gave birth um, in um, a 12-month period, uh, 90 RNA-positive people, um, and followed up with um, them to uh, check the status of their older infants, um, their older children, um, uh, to end their uh, lack of hepatitis C testing and, and wanted to really see um, what the parents' knowledge was around their hep C status, where were the knowledge gaps, where were the communication gaps, did pro, um, pre prenatal provider know, did pediatrician know, and, and where was the drop off. And, um, you know, our um, big takeaways uh, were there was just communication issues that um, uh, a lot of the parents were diagnosed outside of um, the uh, their prenatal care. And so the prenatal care provider didn't know about the status and that information was also not communicated when it was known to the pediatrician. And so, and, and if parent isn't informed about the perinatal risk or, or empowered in those situations, which is very tough to be um, a person in, in prenatal care, um, 
uh, for any of us, um, that um, uh, that information wasn't getting to the pediatrician to inform screening of the infant. Um, and uh, also a big takeaway was that only about a third of the parents were in care for their hepatitis C, let alone um, uh, primed for treatment after um, they were eligible. So um, also a big um, takeaway and concern for us. So um, some potential, I'm sorry, things are like blocking my screen. I can't even see. Um, okay, so some potential activities and interventions um, we, we were thinking about considering and, and, you know, I encourage everybody to think about these and obviously many other things um, that apply to your jurisdiction. Uh, we, we wanted to decide did we want to identify postpartum parents versus pregnant people. Um, we knew we wanted to be doing surveillance um, work. Um, there weren't really clear definitions at the time, but luckily now we have, um, excuse me, a lot more collaboration on this nationally. Did we want to work with providers versus parents? Did we want to focus on the infant versus the mother or parent? And also, this is too much. We just don't have the funding for it. Why would we add to our plate? Um, uh, because nobody's telling us we need to do it. Well, unfortunately, fortunately, we're gluttons for punishment and um, adding on to our own um, uh, plate. Uh, so we added, we did what we could to add some resources to accommodate this. So luckily we uh, petitioned for some city general funds uh, to support a coordinator, um, a, some epidemiologist time and um, some support in case identification. Uh, we have had a robust longitudinal database that um, we're able to utilize um, for surveillance and um, case identification purposes and data matching and um, uh, things like that uh, and data collection. Um, and uh, we do have vital records access, which I know is just a formidable challenge for a lot of jurisdictions. So um, we've been really lucky to have access to birth records. And then we've also had department buy-in um, who were um, invested in um, allowing this hodgepodge program to kind of develop over, over time. And something I do want to say is, is this has been an evolution. Um, and and um, some of what I'm talking about here today is because of, of um, conversations with you all, with other people, with other jurisdictions, and resource limitations, and, um, you know, knowledge gaps being closed over time. So, um, this isn't necessarily comprehensive, but um, I did my best to include a bunch of different things. So our surveillance um, was number one, we, and it is number one, um, we identify people of childbearing age and potential. Um, we are always looking um, for the perinatal exposures. So looking for those um, parents who end up delivering live births um, and then identifying um, uh, uh, perinatal cases based off of the um, CDC CFT case definition. Um, and so um, we utilize a lot of different matching strategies um, and uh, method, different methods to identify those um, pairs um, for exposure. Um, and this is just an area that we're always working on process improvement. ELR has been a really great um, activity for us. We do like to identify parents um, during their pregnancy, um, but we um, are mindful that that is just a resource limitation and as much as we would like to really improve the comprehensive nature of um, pregnancy reporting in ELR, it hasn't been something we have the resources to do. Um, and so um, uh, we've done a little bit where we can, but we're hoping to leverage other um, systems like COVID to help support this as well. We also um, decided that we wanted to um, conduct um, follow-up with both um, prenatal and pediatric providers, as well as um, to the, the pregnant or postpartum parent. Um, and so the provider investigation, we, we confirm the status um, and collect of, of the parent, both the pregnancy status and the hep C status. Um, and then we limit down our follow-up to RNA positive um, or RNA status unknown parents. And then we look at clinical risk factor information and contact um, updated contact info for, for the parent um, as best we can because um, uh, loss to follow up is always a challenge, let alone if you're doing um, uh, pulling pulling outdated surveillance data um, for people who tend to be transient. Um, and we then do outreach to um, the the RNA positive pregnant and postpartum people. Um, we do our best to 
not only educate um, the, the people we're working with um, and are able to reach, but also to learn from them, um, uh, learn from them and um, uh, identify ways that we could maybe um, improve our intervention um, uh, services they need, barriers to prenatal or pediatric care, et cetera. Uh, we do um, have a program that is parallel to, uh, this is a newer development for us, but another program that we have is a navigation to care um, uh, program for people who have hepatitis C and a substance use disorder diagnosis. And we support um, them through their whole treatment um, uh, continuum uh, for hepatitis C and substance use treatment um, uh, and so we offer that to pregnant parents, whether it's now or, you know, six months postpartum, they can engage them if they are prepared. And then we um, uh, ask consent to um, work with the pediatrician about infant testing. And uh, we also educate the parent about what that testing looks like, knowing that a lot of parents might not be at the same pediatrician uh, or a lot of kids might not be at the same pediatrician um, come uh, time for testing. Um, the pediatrician follow-up looks like, um, uh, I have a run-on sentence here, <laughs> uh, initial contact, or, or a, a, sorry, a dropped off um, format here, but uh, initial contact with the pediatrician is to ensure that the exposure is known and ask about the plan of testing. So there are a lot of different um, guidelines around um, uh, screening for infants, and they can be very confusing for providers. Some institutions have their own policies uh, for what uh, process will be followed in-house. Um, and um, we uh, like to clarify that so we know when we can then do subsequent follow-up to confirm uh, when labs were ordered, if they were ordered, um, and if there was any results that may not have been delivered to us uh, in our surveillance system. Um, we also provide guidance on perinatal screening recommendations because um, this isn't something that providers see all the time. We do have some, some major providers who are frequent flyers with us, but others don't see it all the time. And so we like to use that as an opportunity to educate them about the guidelines and why um, uh, we as a health department recommend earlier testing, um, preferably before 12 months of age or by 12 months of age. Uh, we see a lot of drop off and I'll get into that a little bit more, but we like to use it as an opportunity to engage the providers. Um, we would like to do more provider education um, that is um, more pointed and broader, but or is less pointed and more um, more broad. But um, unfortunately, um, sometimes this is just the capacity we have. Um, and then we also um, work with um, uh, uh, DHS locally, um, if, if the um, infant is um, lost to follow-up or um, we don't know who the pediatrician is, we collaborate a lot with our immunizations program to identify a pediatrician as needed um, if we don't know it from the parent or the um, birthing hospital. Um, we also uh, collaborate very extensively with our neonatal abstinence syndrome program. Um, over 60% of um, infants born uh, within our um, intervention program are um, born with NAS, and so we have wanted to really make sure that we're not um, overburdening parent, we're coordinating our messaging, um, and that um, both programs know about, about um, uh, the parents and their needs um, as best as possible. There are some other programs as well that we make sure um, we coordinate with, especially around harm reduction and um, supportive services for parents who might have a substance use disorder. And then um, we do try to do um, educational sessions uh, when we have capacity, which unfortunately is not all the time. Um, something that we're very um, uh, oriented with, um, and as I'm sure um, all of you are, is um, using our data to inform our practices. Um, uh, we uh, measure, um, we've done some analyses measuring um, our, um, the impact um, of our program and um, uh, best outcomes and things like that. We have a parental continuum of care for hepatitis C. Um, on the right is um, uh, some data showing our, um, uh, the success of testing by um, the uh, provider testing policy. And so um, the orange bar is uh, tested for, the infant is tested for hepatitis C um, and um, uh, the blue-ish turquoise is not tested. And so as you can see, the longer the testing, the, the older 
the age of the child um, is um, for the testing policy, uh, the lower the rates of um, screening that ends up happening. Um, and so um, we also do a lot of work. What programs do we need to coordinate with? The NAS program actually grew out of our program because we identified um, how many cases of NAS um, were coming through. And so um, we worked with um, the health department um, more broadly to develop a program that um, could support these these families, whether they were involved with our program or not. So that's been really exciting um, and just always um, trying to um, collaborate internally and externally to maximize care for any of the, the parents we work with. Um, we're always trying to figure out, is our case ascertainment and surveillance work um, uh, effective, comprehensive, et cetera? Um, and so, um, you know, we have limited resources, um, limited time, follow-up, is, time is money, so follow-up is money, and um, we want to make sure we're using the most efficient methods. So we have some, um, we've done a bunch of case ascertainment um, evaluations, one of which will be presented by Emily Waterman, our epidemiologist at CFTE next week. Um, so look for that, wink, wink. Um, we are always looking for new data sources and how to improve um, ELR, including, like I said earlier, leveraging COVID and some methodologies that have come out of that just across surveillance. And then what services can we offer, offer to um, improve outcomes and, and benefit parents and make sure um, we're doing our best to count uh, cases as best as possible? So um, ongoing challenges. Uh, there's a lot of sad faces on here. Um, it's a bummer in some ways, but I, I want us all to be positive and optimistic. So I'm sorry if it comes off a little more bummery than I thought. Staff time is always just a challenge. We all know we don't have enough of it for for all of the work we have to do with hepatitis. Um, the scale of perinatal, it can I think you can go as far as you want to um, or can. Like there's infinite options um, to work with the parent, the infant, and the provider level interventions. Um, we know we can do more with the providers, and that's something that we're really trying to. Um, uh, be focused on, and unfortunately for us, we have to choose right now. So um, we really wanted to make sure that we were, um, you know, providing the the person level intervention. That was that was um, just what we could make happen, and and what we ended up um, putting at the forefront. Um, patient populations uh, that we're working with are um, uh, often a challenge. I know this is the case with Hep C across the country, um, but certainly in um, young people, especially those. Um, who have past or present um, SUD. Um, uh, there's lots to follow up and it's not a small proportion. We always have to be updating our contact information as best as possible. And the longer you wait, the harder it is. And that's another reason why we um, work with pregnant people as much as possible. Um, we, um, and there are just many barriers to the outcomes um, and care that we recommend even if we reach people, um, many of them are systemic um, and we're all battling every day. Um, so um, that can just, just be uh, tough sometimes. But, um, you know, providers, um, we've had a lot of successes with um, some providers who really see the benefit of this work and, and changing their internal policies, uh, but they all have competing priorities. So this is, this is oftentimes a, a challenge. Um, many don't work with people who use drugs um, or provide services that are targeted um, to them. So um, it's just a challenge and the stigma um, uh, can just lead to um, uh, people not wanting to share their hep C status with their pediatrician or, um, uh, or just challenges in building that trust between providers and, and patients. And then uh, dissemination, we, we always want to share um, our, our experiences, but um, peer review process is um, rightfully so um, difficult, but time is, is um, at premium. So those are some of our challenges. We would love funding uh, to do this work uh, more broadly um, and streamline national guidelines, especially around screening uh, infants would be really helpful. Um, that, that is a, a big challenge for us. Um, coordinating uh, providers and their knowledge, um, uh, again, nationally, but also locally will be great. Um, and that would help a lot with uh, guideline adherence for, for um, uh, providers. Um, promoting compassionate care for people who use drugs. Um, 
uh, we are always trying to do that and we're hoping that um, that is something that again continues over time and um, that harm reduction and um, conversations um, about and I don't have this here about hep C treatment um, are integrated into prenatal care um, and it's endless so um, we have lots of things we want to do and um, uh, we are um, humbly uh, looking uh, for this conversation to inspire us and and um, you know, we're excited to um, continue talking about it um, and develop over time. So thank you for your time and to everyone who um, in Philly has contributed to this work. Oh, God. No. I think I'm done. Stop share. Sorry. Thank you, Danica. That was a, there was a lot of helpful information there, and it's exciting to see how much of the program activities your team is moving along with, given the limited staff and timing and the barriers you discussed towards the end. Um, so great work. Um, our next presentation is from Amelia Salmonson from the with the Utah, uh, Utah Department of Health and Human Services. Um, Amelia, feel free to take over. Great, thank you. Um, I think, can you just confirm you can see my screen? Okay. Um, going to be hard to follow Danica, um, really great efforts in Philly. I have been bugging her for too many years about, um, their processes. Um, but I thought it would be helpful as this is helpful to me, um, with, for example, elimination planning, but to hear from. Utah and, and my state and what we're doing and, and kind of some of the, we're certainly not as far along in our efforts. Um, and, you know, even we may be farther than some, but hearing, you know, it, the implementing perinatal hepatitis C, not only surveillance, but um, intervention and follow-up and management is very overwhelming. Um, and so I'm just gonna kind of tell you guys a little bit, well, bit about what we're doing here in, as in Utah. Um, okay, so I thought it would be helpful to provide a quick timeline as well um, to kind of reiterate that this does take time and requires patience. Um, but I will say before I get too far into this, you know, we are lucky. Um, in, in Utah, we have a very robust surveillance system, um, and we do have at least some existing um, data around perinatal. Um, however, the exact way that we manage it within our surveillance system and the actions from public health in terms of follow-up um, are still in progress. Um, and we are also not funded for perinatal hepatitis C, um, which has definitely created in addition to other things, um, a lag in implementation, um, just because it is not as much of a priority when we have other things that we need to do to meet our um, funding um, goals. But in August 2018, and as I was putting this together, I am I'm overwhelmed, I guess, by the fact that I did start this in August 2018. It feels like it was yesterday. And I can't believe how many years have gone by. Granted, COVID was a black hole, but um, we put together a work group with our local health departments, um, essentially assuming that they may hopefully will be doing a lot of the, the work and wanting to ensure that their input was um, part of the discussion. Um, and so we met actually twice a week, um, starting in 2018. And during those meetings, we were um, moving forward very quickly, we developed um, an intervention workflow and dra drafted a, um, an SOP um, for tracking pregnancy events in our NED system called EpiTrax, um, and then um, drafted case report forms for pregnancy and perinatal cases. And we did also draft a educational handout um, similar to one that Philly did. Um, for not necessarily for clinicians, ours was targeted more towards um, general population. Um, and, and during these discussions, it was very overwhelming to determine 
the intervention approach. Um, and I'll kind of get into a little bit more into that. Danica has also touched on that quite a bit. Um, but by January 2020, we were we had everything wrapped up and ready to go. Um, we submitted those documents for internal review. Um, and and the, the process really is once they're approved internally at Department of Health and Human Service, now it's Human Services, um, then it goes to the local health departments again, just for final review and approval. Um, but unfortunately, before our internal review could even happen um, or finalize, COVID happened. And by February 2020, you know, we had had, um, I believe our first case, it was February or March, but that we had our first case in Utah. But most of us, especially in our infectious disease program, myself included, and our local health departments were very much focused on COVID response. So efforts stopped. Um, and when I was actually going through my emails um, to look at this kind of timeline, I didn't see an email again about perinatal until July 2021, um, which was when I was starting to slowly back off of COVID a bit and wanted to revisit this um, because I, you know, I'd been, I wanted to get things going. Um, unfortunately, a lot of our local health departments though, were still very actively involved in COVID. Um, but I did pursue that um, local health department approval. Um, that's what the EAG is. It's our EPI affiliate group. Um, and they did approve of the SOP that we developed, the case report forms and the educational handout. Um, so then in September, 2021, I met with our informatics program to implement um, the questions that we were going to use for surveillance um, and tracking. And then also we were going to be adding um, a pregnancy event condition to our surveillance system. Um, and basically we, we hit kind of a hiccup there and, and not necessarily in a bad, bad way. Um, because of COVID, there was actually improvements to our system and there was, would, is a better way to manage pregnancy actually within the um, hepatitis C pregnant person's condition instead of creating basically a duplicate record that would be looking at their pregnancy. Um, so my informatics program recommended that I go back to, my, to, to the health department, the local health departments and offer basically to streamline this process. Um, and so you know, a lot of back and forth um, with, with the local health departments, as I mentioned, you know, a lot of them were still working on COVID and were not funded for perinatal hep C, neither are they. Um, so in February of this year, 2022, um, you know, with the local health department work group, we reassessed the processes. Um, they ultimately did determine they still want to have that duplicate pregnancy event. Um, but we did simplify our process a bit. Um, initially, when we started the SOP, um, you know, we were wanting to have intervention at pregnancy, after pregnancy, and with a provider. But given just the chaos of the last few years and, and, and people still really being strapped um, with multiple duties, we decided to simplify our process and, and really have somewhat more of a passive approach um, where um, we are, um, you know, working more with providers and then following up with um, children and that come through our system that are reported because they were tested, not necessarily actively trying to, to, to find them. Um, Hopefully we can eventually get to that, but we, you know, our idea was that we wanted to try to start somewhere and start something small um, to at least get moving forward. Um, so um, when I went back to my informatics program in May, um, another little hiccup, also a good one, but um, they are currently working on a direct linkage of birth record data into our surveillance system. Um, so 
you know, they didn't want us to put processes in place and a workflow within our surveillance system that might change in a few months because of the linkage to birth records. So they basically asked us to kind of hold off on at least making any changes in our surveillance system. Um, but at the same time, we don't want to necessarily start too much work without being able to track what's going on. So we're kind of in a weird um, spot of what can we do to kind of keep moving forward and making progress, but without really doing as much maybe case management. Um, and so, you know, until that comes better into place, um, working on provider outreach and education. It's actually interesting how Danica was saying that they want to do more of that and they're doing more, um, I would say, active case finding and, and education among um, pregnant persons and, 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 and children. I think we're kind of taking the opposite approach. Um, and, and not to say that we wouldn't provide education to um, pregnant people. Um, when we, we conduct um, acute hep C case investigation. Um, and so if someone is pregnant who's being investigated as an acute case, we would um, provide this information to them um, about you know, potential perinatal transmission and, and testing um, on the child, but not really doing anything too active at this point. Um, so some barriers and challenges, and I think this probably is consistent with barriers and challenges other jurisdictions are seeing, um, you know, we're not funded for perinatal, um, that may hopefully change in the coming years, um, and COVID, I mean, I, I hate, I think sometimes people blame things on COVID as a cop-out, but it did really, I think we would have had this up and running had we not had a pandemic. Um, I did mention, you know, the birth records, um, being a good thing and I put them in barriers and challenges. However, so it, it is a great tool. Um, but prior to this data linkage, we, we do have a, an MOA with our vital records program and in reviewing some of the data that's available, um, on the birth records, it's, it's pretty limited and um, I do definitely have concerns when it comes to implementation, how much we will actually get from that data. Um, so it, it is definitely, I think, a bit of a challenge. Um, and, and to this point, it's been all manual, but so it may improve with automated um, linkages. Um, the other challenge with perinatal hep C is there's not really an immediate intervention for the pregnant person or the baby, um, you know, at this time, pregnant or treatment and pregnancy is not approved. Um, and then treatment in children is not approved under age three. So, um, I, I think that almost like demotivates people. And then to Danica's point, it creates a gap in communication and a lot of people are lost to follow up. Um, and then at least for, for Utah, um, for the most part, hep C screening and pregnancy is not routine. I think that's probably pretty common in other places. Um, however, we do have some uh, medical providers and uh, systems that are, are starting to add that in, which is nice to see. Um, I did wanna share though some successes. I can't say it's all been bad. Um, hep C in pregnancy is reportable in our communicable disease rule. Um, uh, we're not getting many of those reports, and some of that is is a system issue. Um, we've been talking about, so we have a case report form for pregnancy um, in a Hep C positive person. I don't find paper case report forms or PDF case report forms are sent to us for really any condition very often, um, especially from providers. But so we are having some preliminary conversations too about. Um, creating a, a red cap database where um, providers can report this. Of course, we have to educate them that's available. Um, one other thing that's uh, kind of cool that we were able to get into our uh, UT-NED system is the linkage to pregnancy data. So 
um, if a pregnancy test has been conducted on a, on a case, um, it will pull up within their record um, and show us the result of that pregnancy test. So we can actually determine if someone's pregnant or at least was pregnant at some point. Um, and we'll have the data that test. Um, and then we do have access to birth record data. As I mentioned, we have an MOA with vital records um, and there is a linkage to NEDS that is pending. Um, we don't, as I mentioned, we don't have funding, so we don't technically have an FTE <laughs> allocated to work on um, perinatal follow-up. However, we do have a state dedicated DIS um, who supports our acute hep C case investigations um, and will be able to um, you know, work on these efforts as well and support our local health departments. Um, and I believe this is my last slide. And I think this kind of mirrors a lot of what Danica was saying, but you know, be patient and start small, try not to be overwhelmed. Um, and think about who you want to target. I think it's, I like want to target all of these people, you know, but I think it's worth starting with one and kind of working up from there. Um, and then also determining when that intervention happens. Again, I think if you can do an intervention during pregnancy as well as after birth, that's great. Um, and doing, you know, a follow-up even after um, 18 months, 12 to 18 months with a child, but um, doing all of that is may not be realistic. So kind of determining what in is what capacity do you have? Um, and then, as I mentioned, I was kind of talking about active versus passive surveillance. So, um, you know, we, we're going to start really small and um, primarily rely on testing that's being done on children um, and the cases that we're seeing um, that are pregnant through our acute hep C case investigations. Um, and then provider education is so critical. Um, okay, yes, and this is my information. Um, sorry, we went a little over, um, but yeah, I think we can answer any questions or discussion. Thank you, Amelia, that was great. Um, if anyone has any questions related to either presentation or anything discussed, uh, in the VLC today, please feel free to raise your hand or drop questions in the chat and we can work on answering those. Can I, can I just, I have some, some responses um, for Amelia. I, I, that was really a great presentation. I love the timeline and I'm going to do that now. And I just wanted to, to level set that we've been working on this, like the first analyses we started with perinatal were back in 2014. So this is almost this is over eight years that we've been doing it. We, I, I wrote it down so that I would remember. Um, we did our pilot um, in 2015. We launched our program officially at the beginning of 2016. We made pregnancy also a reportable um, uh, status for anybody who is um, has hepatitis C. Uh, we did that in 2017. We made those educational materials in 2017. The NAS program was launched in 2018. So. A lot of this work has been done over a very long time, so I just wanted to put that out there. And then in terms of provider education, I, Amelia, I think that your point about like um, that it, it's interesting that like we went we went in the in the intervention direction. We did a lot of provider education up front, and I think that the challenge we had we have is that there's so much provider turnover, right? At least in Philadelphia, there's a large number of medical uh, medical training. Uh, institutions, whether they're med schools, pharmacy schools, what have you. And so there's just high turnover whenever you do provider-based education. And I think that we just, we did a, a lot up front and, and just haven't been able to maintain it. But um, I, that's not to say it's not worthwhile. It's incredibly critical. Um, I think we've just um, capacity-wise had to, to pivot a little bit. I'll stop talking. And I'll put my email in the chat too. Oh, thanks, Zakia. Even better. And yeah, yeah, and the stigma is is no joke. Um, we see so much of it. Um, so many of our our parents don't want to go to a provider because they're so judgmental. 
especially if their child was born with any um, uh, exposure to a substance in utero. And um, it's, it's just so sad. It's so sad and contraproductive. I'll wait a little bit to see if there's any questions. Uh, and if not, I have some questions uh, that I think are relevant to both, both of you. Um, so I, I, I guess one thing I'm wondering is, you know, like what are some mechanisms or methods local health jurisdictions could use to scale up their perinatal have C surveillance given, you know, that there's many are un underfunded or not funded at all for this work. Amelia, you spoke a little bit about the work group uh, with local health jurisdictions in 2018. And it sounds like that was very, a, a lot of them local health jurisdictions were engaging and it was kind of pretty active meeting twice a week, I think you mentioned. So th that seems, you know, how, how do we convince, since given that many of us on the call are state health departments uh, from the polling questions, um, how do we, what were some strategies you used to get increased engagement? And Danica, this, you know, the same question applies for you, if, if you, you all want to share. Um, I don't know if I have any specific strategies. Maybe people just like enjoy working with me, which sounds cocky because I don't, maybe they don't. But um, I, I think one thing though that I do recommend and I is like, I would send out a doodle poll for like, I think we eventually like found a cadence, but to, to ensure it was based really on like the time that was most convenient for all of them, which that sounds really basic, but I don't, I don't know. And I think the other thing is a lot of these folks were, they're also working with perinatal B. So I think for them, they see it as a priority, which we kind of mirrored our SOP for hep C follow-up off of B. I mean, again, though, that was though where the conversation of like, well, when do we like follow up with them? Because there's no vaccine at birth. Um, I, I really feel like honestly, I'm just lucky too, because I think we, I really strive to have such a good relationship with the local health departments. And I think that's the other thing is there's a mutual respect there. And if, if you're taking the time to really make sure that you're catering it to them. Um, I also did a lot of the like backend work, like wrote the SOP and presented it to them and then got feedback and made basically any changes that they wanted and made sure that it was really based on all of their input and feedback because at the end of the day, they're the ones doing the work. Um, there are certain approaches that I am like, I think this can be done better, but if that's the way they want to do it, then that's fine with me. <laughs> Great. Yeah, I think um, for us, um, it's funny you say like working off of, and that's funny, it makes perfect sense, working off of the perinatal head B work, um, that's, that's exactly where this this these activities came from and and started modeling the program from there um i think um the best advice in terms of like a starting point especially for states and especially if your capacity is really small is to think automation um and and to measure the issues try to get a sense of just so people of childbearing age who have hepatitis c in your jurisdiction and if you have capacity to see how many people are, you know, are, are born to, to those individuals, um, you can, there's a lot of estimates you can give to, um, to try to work around that, even if you don't have um, complete access to the vital stats. And so I think just trying to, to take it step by step, don't think you have to, to go for the, you know, the full, full end intervention. And then um, uh, thinking about, um, you know, we, that's why we really like ELR. So we don't have to do outreach as much. We have confirmed statuses, you know, sent to us. You don't have to do provider outreach. That's been really great um, and helpful. Um, and starting from there can be a good place. And then when working with providers, and this is probably more applicable to the uh, local health departments um, uh, on the call and then who you partner with, but 
we have really like the providers who we work with um, tend to think that we're actually helping them, which is really exciting um, where we're reminding them of something um, they, you know, we try to work with them in the best way possible. Do you want us to send you one offs um, when we identify somebody? Um, do you want us to, um, how, when would you like a reminder from us? Would you like just a fax for everybody this month who still has outstanding testing um, for the infants? Things like that um, can be um, uh, just just being able to meet the provider where they're at too, because each institution and, and system is, is different. And it's not just the patient that has a lot of challenges and barriers they're dealing with too. So we try to be respectful of that. And that was before the pandemic. So you add in the pandemic and you know, burnout and competing priorities are stacked against us. So. And Amelia mentioned contact tracers. Yeah, for those who can't see the chat, Amelia also added, um, uh, you could recommend, uh, I, I also hate to recommend this, but you could leverage COVID contact tracers with training to do follow up with cases if HCB staff are limited. Um, and Isabel saying a common theme in hearing from both jurisdictions is how much value there is in relationship building with not only providers, but other HD programs. Uh, absolutely. Yes. Um, we talked a little bit about provider training. Um, my next question is kind of a little bit more broad. Like what strategies or methods could jurisdictions use to increase patient testing and follow-up? And um, how can public health provide more information on and testing on what to do? I mean, sky's the limit, right? Like you can reach out to every person like we do and, and um, you know, spend a lot of time on it. But I think too, like having, you know, having guidelines posted on your, your web, your, you know, health department website can be helpful. Even, even just highlighting that this is going on. And again, that goes to like just measuring how many, how many um, potential cases there could be. Um, that can be kind of a lightning um, rod for for providers being interested for um, systems being willing to to come to the table about this. So um, I'll stop talking, Amelia. You go ahead. I don't I don't really have much to add. Um, there was something I was thinking of and I lost it. So I'm sorry. <laughs> My next question is a little bit um, related to something both of you discussed um, and it's around data. So um, like, can you speak a little bit more about to what the challenges around data have been in your perinatal work? Um, and I know that both of you mentioned some matching around uh, birth records. Um, if there's anything that you'd like to kind of expand on that and what the main barriers have been and potential strategies for moving things forward. Data realm. I think it's similar almost to the like previous question and response in that awareness and like from a pro like so if you're if I'm if we're kind of as I mentioned waiting for results to come in I mean we don't see very many tests on young kids but does that mean that there shouldn't, there shouldn't be more? Um, and so, you know, pushing and making awareness that this isn't, is an issue. Um, I will say, and I feel like I'm going to start annoying people as I've been talking about the state uh, opioid settlement dollars, but <laughs> I was, uh, I'm like, kind of like poking everyone I can that's involved in the conversations. And I think it's for us, at least it's ultimately up to our legislators to determine where that funding goes. But I'm like, this funding needs to go to hepatitis, like at least not all of it, obviously, but I mean, we, I mean, children being born to hep C positive persons is a direct result of the opioid epidemic. Like, I don't know like how far I can shout that. So yeah. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Sorry. No, that was it. I was reading Rachel's comment. Go ahead. 
Um, you know, just in terms of data, I think you, you hit the nail on the head, Amelia. You don't know what you don't know, right? And so that's the challenge here is you don't know how many people are being screened during prenatal care, you don't, or, or how many people are not being screened, right? We know who is screened and who is positive, but we don't know the other side. Um, you don't know how many infants aren't being tested for hepatitis C unless you have that denominator. Um, and you know that you're getting po all positives and all negatives, right? So there's a lot of challenges there. Um, I think the, the it, I, it's actually for us, like conceptually, pregnancy is a tough, is a tough thing when it comes to surveillance data. In a lot of places, pregnancy as a status is not a reportable thing unless connected to a condition, right? And so a lab has to collect it to give it to you or a provider has to collect it. It's also something that changes. It can, it changes literally overnight um, as soon as a baby is born um, or, or the pregnant, as soon as the pregnancy ends. And then there can be another pregnancy in a very short window. So in a longitudinal database, collecting something that is repeatable within a case that isn't even about necessarily the labs that you're collecting for that, that's been a huge challenge for us is just how to collect this data all in one place and following our model of a person and, and, and event centric, a person slash event centric database that collects longitudinal um, uh, hepatitis C in one place, but keeping pregnancy within there. And then how do you add in case management to that? How do you link that to a, an infant and then how do you track that infant over time too? And so um, it's that, that conceptualization of pregnancy and, and intercalating it into this hepatitis C world has been a huge challenge for us. And we learned a lot of lessons of what not to do in our work around perinatal hepatitis B. And so we, we really tried to be conscious of it when doing perinatal C work, but our, the data is not fun for us to analyze because it, it actually requires quite a bit of um, work to, to put it all together and, and um, pull out pregnancy from within this event. Um, so those are some challenges and I'm happy to go into more depth with, about that with anybody who's interested, but um, I've become very ex interested in that over time and trying to parse that out. Yeah. Thank you for that. That was insightful. I know we're almost at the hour, so I just have one last question. Um, in the beginning, when we were doing our poll, you know, only about 10% of the respondents feel like they have a really great grasp on perinatal and feel like they really know what they're doing. So my final question is, uh, for the jurisdictions or folks that have just begun developing their perinatal hep C programs, or have not started at all, what is some advice you would leave them with? You're not alone. You you're not alone in where you are in the process. And you're also not alone in that we're all trying to figure this out. And, and some of us have done more around it. And so I'd encourage everyone to not be shy and to ask questions. Reach out to Isabel if, if um, uh, I, I don't even know, <laughs> Isabel, I don't even know. Um, but um, uh, if you wanna reach out, um, to NASDAQ and get the support of from Amelia or myself or anybody else around your experiences, you know, or any of the other amazing jurisdictions, Tennessee's done some great work too. Do it because asking, having one, one conversation could probably save you a lot of time. So you're not alone. Hang in there. Yeah. And, and I, I, I kind of said this as well in my presentation, but start small. I mean, you can start somewhere and always grow from there. And that's kind of what I'm trying to do. If I could just get it together. <laughs> great. Well, thank you, Danica. Thank you, Emilia, for your great presentations. And thank you to the attendees for participating um, and joining us today. And uh, ask that team for putting the BLC session together. Uh, just a reminder for participants to please complete um, the session evaluation survey via the link in the chat box. And I think that that should be posted soon. Um, can I confirm that with the team or? I saw it in there, I think. I think it was up. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah I'm sure you'll up. get an email too if you don't fill it out, so. Yeah, and I think that concludes our session. Uh, thank you, everyone. Thanks everyone, thanks, thanks Mike.